Our main story tonight concerns food delivery, the thing that can turn a lethally depressing Saturday night into a lethally depressing Saturday night with pad thai. <laughs> Specifically, we're going to talk about food delivery apps. You are probably familiar with them, whether you're a user or a viewer of their constant ads, featuring everyone from Jennifer Aniston to Big Bird to this Uber Eats Super Bowl one, starring none other than Diddy. And I'm guessing Uber Eats might be regretting that last one right now. <laughs> They've even released ads for special occasions like this. What are you eating this pride? Well, if you're a top, it seems like you can eat whatever you want. But if you're a bottom, you're expected to starve? Not this pride. Introducing the bottom-friendly menu from Postmates. That is a real ad for a bottom-friendly menu from Postmates featuring an eggplant in leather fetish gear. Looking like a character from VeggieTales who escaped their evangelical upbringing and found happiness. And by the way, it is good to see the peach from Call Me By Your Name staying booked and busy. Gay parts should go to gay actors. But even beyond unsolicited sex diet tips, people use delivery apps for all sorts of reasons, and some very good, as this driver for DoorDash explains. It's all, it's all sorts. The average customer, it's, like, it's not like a bunch of lazy people. It's, a lot of people need this because they're too busy with kids or they don't have a license for whatever reason. People also that are just drunk or stoned and they don't want to drive. They're actually being responsible and they don't want to drive and get the food themselves. So I'll deliver to them. You know, there's plenty of times I'll come to a door and the door will open and so much pot smoke will come from. <laughs> and the person's eyes are like super red. And I love that. I know that's so funny. It's like some guy, he's like college age and he's just like, oh, thank God, the food's here. Yeah, I love that too. I I know that might be hard to believe from me, someone who looks like he's only ever confiscated weed, but I'm all about the sticky icky. I'm like Miss Piggy the way I'm hitting that green. <laughs> Even now, I'm as high as a giraffe's arsehole and as spaced out as a ninth grader's essay trying to meet the page limits. I get it, OK? <laughs> but even if you are not stoned, these apps are incredibly convenient. And the truth is, if you weren't using them before 2020, you almost definitely have since, because Early on in COVID, after in-person dining shut down, their growth skyrocketed. Sales for delivery apps nearly doubled and haven't gone down since. These apps basically had the kind of meteoric pandemic-era rise that Skype absolutely thought they were in for. <laughs> and what happened, Skype? You had it and you lost it. We used to use Skype as a verb to mean to video call someone, rather than what it means now, to completely fuck up the easiest opportunity imaginable. The pandemic truly was a watershed moment for delivery apps, and they marketed themselves heavily as the saviors of the restaurant industry. Restaurants are our family, the cornerstone of our communities. And our family needs help. Right now, they're facing a crisis, and they're counting on your takeout and delivery orders to help them through. Because if we don't treat restaurants like family today, they might not be around to treat us like family tomorrow. Grubhub. Together, we can help save the restaurants we love. Wow, that hits all the checkmarks of every pandemic-era ad. Soft, twinkly piano music? Check. An eclectic cross-section of races, ages, ethnicities and genders? Check. A vague threat that if we don't participate in capitalism, the things we hold near and dear will be destroyed? Checkity check. But even as our usage of these apps has increased, there's been a rising chorus of criticism regarding their business models, perhaps summed up best by this New York City council member. When you see something uh, that sucks the blood out of anything, you call them leeches. And that is exactly what Grubhub is. It's true. Well, when you see something that sucks the blood out of anything, you do call them leeches. Also, if you see something that has 10 stomachs, 32 brains, 9 pairs of testicles and several hundred teeth, that's a leech too, but admittedly doesn't apply quite as neatly here. And while that might sound harsh to you, it's not totally unfair. Because for all the convenience these apps provide us, the customers, they come with a huge cost for everyone else involved, from restaurant owners to those delivering our food. So tonight, Let's talk about delivery apps. And first, let's talk about what food delivery used to look like. Picture it. It's, it's 2003, and you're at home hungry after a long day of work at Blockbuster Video. So <laughs> you check out the giant stack of takeout menus you keep in a drawer, then, trigger warning for anyone under 30, you'd make a phone call <laughs> to a restaurant 
say your order out loud to a person who worked there, and then a delivery worker also hired by the restaurant came to drop it off, then you tipped in cash and tuned back into American Idol to watch the most famous person in the world, Reuben Studdard. <laughs> The system was by no means perfect, but restaurants made a profit on your order and delivery drivers were at least theoretically paid as employees. But over the past decade, apps have fundamentally shifted that model. Now, the ordering part tends to take place via an app, which then contacts a delivery driver who typically doesn't work for the restaurant, who transports the food to you. And to be fair, there have been some upsides in this model for restaurants. There's definitely a lot of positives, and one of them is, like, knowing that there's a delivery guy nearby to pick up their food, and we don't have to have someone on staff. We would need about 15 guys here at all times. Right, before delivery apps, that owner would have needed 15 guys just standing around at all times, which honestly sounds less like a restaurant and more like someone describing an orgy that didn't quite take off. <laughs> And apps will point out that they also put restaurants' menus in front of hungry people, which can help them with reaching more customers and growing revenue. But revenue isn't the same as profit. And let's talk about how exactly these companies make money, because they make some off the various fees that you might see when you order, but they also charge restaurants 15 to 30% of an order in commissions. And that number can get even higher when apps charge restaurants additional fees for everything from boosting their placement in the app to making them part of special promotions. And especially during the pandemic, when online orders were basically the only ones coming in, restaurants who'd signed up for an app could be unpleasantly surprised when they saw just how little was left after the apps had taken their cut. We signed up with the, during this pandemic. It's just any way to get any income, to have cash on hand, to be able to keep our staff. This was Grubhub's bill to the Warren. Out of total orders of more than $16,000, Grubhub gave the restaurant only about 7000 back. It was equal to 42% of our sales we got. So they took 58% of it. It's true. They took 58% of their sales. I don't know that just saying percentages at you might not be that helpful, even though you know you are watching an episode of numbers being yelled at you with human <laughs> squid words. But 58% is a lot. Now, Grubhub insists that that restaurant agreed to those fees up front and that 58% is an outlier. But it's worth noting, the Washington Post recently ran an experiment where they ordered the same meal from this restaurant in San Francisco on three different apps. The meal itself cost $20.69 before fees, taxes and tip. And when they contacted the restaurant, they found that for Uber Eats, the restaurant got $14.48 back. For Grubhub, it got $12.47. And for DoorDash, it only got $10.59. Those are mafia margins. Also, <laughs> as a quick side note, what a fun assignment for a journalist that was. Sometimes <laughs> journalists track down sources or pour through thousands of pages of documents. Other times, you get to order chicken palm a bunch of times in a row. <laughs> it's really the luck of the draw. But it's gone to the point where many restaurants have taken to increasing their prices on the apps to at least partially offset those fees. That is why you may have noticed food often costs more on an app than it does at the restaurants. And you might think, well, restaurants should just refuse to be listed on these sites then. But resisting them hasn't always worked. Apps have repeatedly added restaurants against their will. In DC alone, Grubhub was accused of listing more than 1,000 restaurants available for delivery that they didn't have contracts with. And if you're thinking, well, I still don't see a problem, they get to be on the app without paying for it, there are actually multiple issues there. Not every restaurant wants to do delivery or is even set up for it. And Grubhub's been accused of not warning restaurants before listing them, leading to them being suddenly inundated with orders they never expected. One in California even complained about Grubhub's menu listing food that it does not actually make <laughs> and has never made. <laughs> Basically, Grubhub would list a restaurant without its permission or knowledge and then make money by charging you a high delivery fee to bring the food to your door. But that might put the restaurant itself in a tough spot because they might be disappointing customers in ways they don't even realize. M Street Baking Company in Howell is open for takeout during the pandemic. Like many restaurants, they were approached to join Grubhub for food delivery, but declined. We found out that they were sending people in, pretending to just be regular customers, but actually working for Grubhub and delivering our stuff without our knowledge. They were offering milkshakes. We don't put lids on our milkshakes because they go directly to you. So now it's going into somebody else's car that they could cough on, sneeze on. As a business, if I knew that a second party was handling your food, I would package your products probably differently than if I knew it was going right to you. 
Yeah, of course you would, and I am glad about that. Because I, for one, do not want to drink a milkshake that's been raw-dogging the air in <laughs> Kyle's vape-smoke-filled Honda Civic. And the thing is, this practice has been standard in the industry right from the start. Just listen to the founder of Postmates talk about the company's early days. When we launched Postmates three years ago, we did deliveries from Chipotle's restaurant, and we got a cease and desist from them. And they what? said, we got a cease and desist from them. And they said, like, guys, we don't really, we're a little bit concerned about the food quality. Right. But, you know, what did we have to lose? So we decided to ignore it. Oh, you did, did you? <laughs> That's fun. And imagine getting lectured on food safety by Chipotle, <laughs> the biggest red flag imaginable, and blowing that off. Also, I just want to go back so you can see Jim Cramer's expression there, because this is the happiest I've ever seen anyone look. <laughs> he is positively giddy at this story of corporate recklessness. He looks like a kid meeting a dog for the first time. <laughs> no one has ever been happier than this. And in the case of Grubhub, it's occasionally engaged in tactics that seem more like a protection racket. For instance, in 2020, it allegedly listed restaurants that it didn't partner with them as closed or not accepting online orders even when they were, which feels especially shitty, coming from the same company that made that ad saying that, together, we can help save the restaurants we love. I guess Grubhub just forgot to add and burn the ones that don't make us money to the <laughs> fucking ground. It is no wonder Restaurant owners have increasingly turned on these apps, likening them to a hostage situation and selling your soul to the devil, <laughs> which is, if anything, too kind. At least when you make a deal with the devil, he offers you something cool, like a sick golden fiddle in return. <laughs> and he surrenders, even when I think there's a pretty good case that he's the better fiddler. Sure, Johnny does rosin up his bow and play that fiddle hard, but he's sampling old folk songs. There's nothing original there. The devil, however, is playing an original dissonant composition backed up by a band of demons. He's bringing way more to the musical table. Now, we don't have time for me to play both sides and fully convince you, but go listen to that song again and tell me you're not having way more fun listening to the devil. <laughs> Happy Easter, by the way. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not just the restaurants that these apps can harm, it's also the delivery workers. In most places, delivering for these companies is gig work. You set your own hours and drive as much or as little as you choose. And companies have sold this as a great thing. Grubhub runs recruiting spots showing happy people balancing childcare, careers as artists, with working part-time doing deliveries. And other companies make similar claims, sometimes in wildly over-the-top ways, like the head of DoorDash here. I think in many ways, dashers on DoorDash look very similar to consumers in the sense that um, they value their time um, as much or sometimes more um, than money. And, and, and they, they, in effect, are choosing um, you know, some of these part-time gig opportunities so that um, they can, you know, save for a project, whatever that may be, whether that's, you know, buying a gift for someone or starting an orphanage. <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> starting an orphanage? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Orphanages aren't generally side hustles. <laughs> You don't tend to see Rachel shelter for loose babies. But I guess if you're a tech bro, you've got it all planned out. First, you get a bunch of venture capital to disrupt the orphanage space. <laughs> then you corner the orphanage market, automate it with robot workers to take care of the kids, create a rating system for potential adoptive parents to rate the baby's vibe, fire babies who fail said vibe check, zero severance, obviously, make wild claims about future profitability, and before you know it, boom, it's IPO time. Innovative, <laughs> profitable, orphanages. <laughs> but the truth is, for many of those engaged in gig work, it's not a side job, it's their main source of income. And that can be a real problem when you consider that delivery apps classify their workers as independent contractors, meaning they have to pay for all of their own expenses. And as this guy in New York explains, that can be a lot. The bike itself cost between $1,800 and $1,900 new. I upgraded it in many ways. For example, the seat, the phone holder, so I can have it over here. This battery cost me almost $450, so the total would be up to $2,500, because if only the bike costs $1,800 plus the battery, that's $2,200. And I had to buy the backpack, because the companies don't give you one. And a helmet, because they don't give you one either. 
look, that is all ridiculous, but the backpack might be the most egregious part there. <laughs> this is a backpack you can't use for anything else. Imagine using it for school, unless you're a second grader <laughs> who shows up every day with a social studies book, a PB&J, and 13 orders of Pad Key Mao. It doesn't really work. But the expenses are just the beginning here. Workers are also at the mercy of the app's opaque algorithms, which are used to dictate speed, behaviour and, ultimately, the wages of the workers. Many apps set up a game-like system of rewards and penalties, offering high scores for being on time and low scores and fewer orders for tardiness. And, of course, a significant part of that system is negative reviews. You might think a bad review is going to a restaurant or the app itself, but all workers know Getting one can severely restrict your options going forward. In fact, just a few negative responses have the power to dry up worker income or even get them booted off the platform altogether. And those who've studied this will tell you that dynamic is a significant problem. Much of reputation systems were put in place to be able to give consumers reviews of products that doesn't transfer well to workers' effort, turning it into the equivalent of evaluating whether we got a good coffee. That place where there's slippage between a product and a person's um, labor is, is dangerous. We'll replace the tyranny of the boss with tyranny of an algorithm. And that is much worse, I will tell you. As a computer scientist, I will tell you that that's much worse. Right, that is a terrible system. Workers have even called the algorithm the Patron Phantasma or Phantom Boss, which sounds like a reality show on Max that somehow already has 12 seasons. <laughs> and this downward pressure is a big part of why you might see delivery workers speeding or going the wrong way down a street on their bike. The clear incentive is to make as many orders as you can, as quickly as you can, even if that means compromising safety. And speaking of safety, these jobs can be risky. In cities like New York, delivery workers are constantly dodging traffic and have been robbed and attacked. And that's even before people ask them to bring them food through extreme weather, like blizzards and even floods. And by the way, don't do that! <laughs> if you see a flash flood warning pop up on your phone and immediately open Grubhub, sorry, you don't get to go to heaven. That was the <laughs> test! And you failed it! It is frankly no wonder that delivery driving is among the deadliest occupations in the country. And because these workers are independent contractors, apps don't have to pay for their health insurance. In fact, one survey found that of those who'd experienced a work-related injury, three out of four delivery workers said they paid for medical care out of their own pocket. All of which can lead to things like this supposedly heartwarming human interest story from January about a video that had gone viral. Bro, what are you doing? Are you serious? I got bills to pay, bro. I respect that, dude. That's crazy. This is how Kevin Ross has been making a living, delivering food on a bike with a broken foot. Watch as he straps a walker onto the bike so he has support when he goes inside restaurants. Back in September, Kevin says he was making a delivery for Grubhub when he was hit by a car. I got hit. I, I blacked out. Next thing I know, I'm in the hospital. He needed surgery, and doctors told him recovery would take months. But with hardly any savings, he had no choice but to get back to work. Well, hold on. No choice? What do you mean? Grubhub says they're all about giving their delivery workers choice. They get to choose their own hours, choose to run a red light rather than be punished by the algorithm, and they get to choose to get back to work while severely injured instead of facing crushing medical bills. They've got more choices than Sophie. Haven't seen the movie. <laughs> so, workers are vulnerable because they lack labour protections and health insurance, and all of this risk is in service of a job where, like, unfortunately, most service jobs, most of their income comes in the form of tips which can make up a third to half of their total earnings. But the thing is, those tips obviously aren't guaranteed. The Verge interviewed a delivery worker who reported biking from 77th Street on the Upper East Side, 18 blocks south and over the Queensborough Bridge, then up through Long Island City and over another bridge to Roosevelt Island, <laughs> all to deliver a single slice of cake for no tip at all. And look, I get that if you're ordering delivery on a single slice of cake, you are clearly going through something, because that is <laughs> the single saddest order any human being could make. But you got a fucking tip! And at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, these companies are driving restaurants and delivery workers to ruin just to make massive profits. So you might be surprised to hear this. We should start by acknowledging that today Uber Eats does not make money. Janelle Salonave is head of Uber Eats. We've been very uh, public about the fact that it's not yet profitable. 
and neither are her competitors. The platforms themselves lose a ton of money in the hundreds of millions of dollars, billions collectively. Why does this business even make sense? I'm not sure it does. And I think they're still trying to figure out how to make money at this, even today. Wow. They're still trying to figure out how to make money at this. These are companies valued at billions of dollars, and yet they're being talked about the same way you talk about your cousin who sells jewellery on Etsy. <laughs> and while that might sound counterintuitive, it actually makes perfect sense. Because the old menus in a drawer form of delivery set certain firm limits. It involved one restaurant directly hiring a delivery worker who then delivered food to a limited area. But these apps introduce whole new categories of cost to the equation, from marketing to lobbying to building and maintaining a whole website. And they're basically following the classic tech disruptor model of using Wall Street money to grow at all costs, corner a market, undercut their competitors and then buy them up, all with the ultimate goal of monopolising the sector and then massively raising prices. Think about how Uber and Lyft used to be much cheaper than traditional taxis and then, once they dismantled that model, they jacked their prices way up. We're just at the point in the cycle where companies can lose a ton of money, keep prices low for consumers, even as they try and offset that by squeezing restaurants and delivery workers at the bottom. But the consolidation era has very much begun. Uber Eats bought Postmates, DoorDash bought Caviar, and Grubhub merged with Seamless. In fact, Grubhub and DoorDash alone comprise more than 20 companies that once competed with one another. And some of these companies will tell you that, that they're now either breaking even or turning a slight profit, though some of those claims have significant caveats to them. But in general, we're currently in a weird situation where the restaurants are losing out, the delivery workers are losing out, and even the companies are struggling. The main winner so far has actually been us, the customers. <laughs> because as this business journalist points out, we're getting an incredibly convenient service and paying less than it's technically worth. I call this the millennial lifestyle subsidy, right? Every single time that you're using DoorDash or using Uber, you're getting a little bit of money back from these companies. They're saying, we're never going to charge you as much as the service actually costs. So I think it's ironic, I think it's interesting, and I also think it just can't last. And he's probably right. Though, personally, I find it a little hard to get mad at the idea of millennials getting some sort of subsidy in life. <laughs> After all, this is a group who will never be able to afford a house, is drowning in student debt and can't even enjoy Harry Potter anymore. <laughs> you can't spell millennial without three massive L's. <laughs> but if it truly is the case that we're headed to a point where a few massive companies dominate this industry, now might be the time to talk about putting some real guardrails up. And I will say, some places are trying. Here in New York, thanks to the hard work of, among others, a collective of delivery workers called Los Deliveristas Unidos, the city passed a law that guarantees a minimum pay rate for delivery workers. But the apps haven't made it easy. Once that rule rolled out, they increased their fees to users and restaurants and tried to reduce the end price to the consumer by making it harder to find the tipping option. If you live in New York, check to make sure you're still tipping people, cos it's possible that you're not. And in California, the state passed a law in 2019 expanding protections to gig workers, but some of the big delivery apps, along with rideshare companies and others, pushed a ballot proposition called Prop 22 that would carve themselves out of that law. And they went all out to get it passed. The latest data from the Secretary of State's office show Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Postmates and Instacart have spent more than $184 million combined campaigning for Prop 22. It is very um, David and Goliath, if you will. Um, these billionaire corporations spending so much money to exempt themselves from basic labor protections. It tells you what it's worth to them. Right. It does tell you what it's worth to them. At least $184 million. <laughs> And that's a fuck ton of money. That's as much as, and this is true, this racehorse. Think about that. They're denying workers <laughs> basic labour rights when instead they could be getting in on the ground floor of this horse. <laughs> and I get it. I, I get where that valuation's coming from. <laughs> and the sad thing is that ballot initiative passed and it could be very hard to undo given it requires a seven-eighths vote in both the State Assembly and Senate to amend it in any way, which is unprecedented. Although that part, at least, may hopefully get overturned by California's Supreme Court later this year. And there are fights brewing in other places, including Seattle, which is considering rolling back worker protections, and Massachusetts, where several apps are pushing for a Prop 22-style ballot initiative this November. But while these issues get addressed at the federal, state and city level, it might also be worth talking about what you yourself can do 
in the meantime, because I am not saying you shouldn't use delivery apps. A lot of people rely on them, from working parents to disabled people to people who are, like me right now, baked out of their fucking minds. <laughs> but the fact is, it is just too easy to use these apps while completely forgetting the actual human beings behind them whose fates you control by just pressing a button. So, so when it comes to restaurants, if there is one that you like to order from, ask if there is a way that they would rather you do that than through an app, and if there is, do it. And when it comes to delivery workers, remember, bad reviews can directly impact their livelihood. So I would go with five stars across the board. Basically, if you're rating anything less than five stars, there has to be visible semen in your food. And <laughs> you have to be absolutely sure that it's not just a glaze. And even then, I'd still go with four stars. <laughs> and while this should go without saying, you have to tip. And if you're making someone cross multiple bridges with a single piece of cake, first, I'm so sorry about whatever is going on <laughs> in your hectic life, but you need to tip even more. And if, if we all do this, then and only then, we'll be able to say with a clear conscience, oh, thank God, the food's here. <laughs>